What do you think about this amazing rally? I mean, 45% from the bottom for the S&P 500, but we've seen big rallies here in Europe as well on the DAX, for example, even as companies, uh, um, governments around the world intentionally shut down their own economies. Um, so many investors must have gotten this wrong. Good morning. Thanks for having me on your show. And indeed, this is a question I get all the time, uh, a very legitimate one. If we take a look at the macro picture, let's remember there's a few things that, uh, at the moment at least, drive the demand for equities. Uh, you're right in saying we've seen an amazing rally. Both the stocks and the S&P trade on something that looks like 25 times uh, 2020. So th this is pretty demanding, pretty, pretty pricey range. But keep in mind today that over a quarter of all debt outstanding corporate and sovereign has negative yields. If you're a pension fund or a major insurance company or an endowment, you know, you're looking at a fixed income market even in the long end that, that basically yields very little. The World Bank is forecasting a $400 trillion global pension deficit in the next 30 years. So where are you going to find yield? Where are you going to find returns? Mm. Equity, for once, stands in, in pretty good stead. So that, that's point one. There are definitely macro elements uh, that make equity more attractive, even if valuations are high. Point number two is we're always looking at the big indices, and the big indices essentially favor blue chips, and, and that's the way it should be. So when we look at the overall economy, we see a much more contrasted figure. But if you look at the shape of intervention, monetary, you know, government instruments, they have privileged debt in general and bank debt in particular. And we know that SMEs are a lot less uh, avid for, for debt. Many of them are already heavily indebted. So the tools that have been used by, for, you know, for means of public intervention have heavily favored blue chips. And what are analysts saying today? They're saying that the blue chips are probably going to make it. Of course, some sectors are looking at difficulties. People talk about retail, talk about airlines. But in that area, some companies have done very well. There's probably going to be some consolidation. We're already seeing some signs that the availability of cheap money and the protection given to some large companies gives them opportunities for consolidation. So that, that, that's part of uh, point number two. Yes. And number three, that's obviously going to lead in some important areas to a concentration in market share, as we always see as a result of regulatory or fiscal intervention in, in fewer hands. Some companies that have the correct business model, tech in particular, are benefiting from this. And I think because they're such a, an important uh, weight in the, in the big indices, the markets are reflecting that. If you look at SMEs, and that'll be my concluding point on this on this, on this question, if you look at mid-size and listed companies, there the picture is much, much tougher. And, and I think the um, likelihood of a strong recovery, because we're looking for, um, um, you know, advanced economy probably for 6% uh, uh, downward uh, GDP spirals this year, the recovery of the SME sector is going to be very important to the recovery of the job market. Okay. If you're in a labor-intensive industry, it obviously, is. It is. you're not going to have too many problems. There's and, a lot of you, unemployment you, out there. You make a lot of good points there about uh, why we're seeing this rally in global stocks then, Xavier. But what that... I guess that doesn't preclude... We could still see uh, waves of corporate insolvency. Do you see that coming? Is that something we're storing up for the future? Um, I, I think that's a good point. I think it's likely that we're going to see some potentially, as we've already seen, spectacular bankruptcies, depending, of course, on the bankruptcy regime. The U.S. regime is far more advantageous, favors the recovery far more than the very fragmented European uh, bankruptcy regime, which, according to almost everyone in the space, needs reform, but where it hasn't been achieved. So I think the legal framework is also very, very important. Uh, so we are going to see some of those. But let's not forget that cheap money is available. We, we've seen the recovery. Look at Hertz, for example, and others. And that will support uh, distress investing, that will support large pools of capital that are looking at opportunities if management is able to articulate a good business plan. 
But the underlying trend, and, and this has been accelerated but not generated by COVID, is that there are some business models that are old. There are some business models that are going to be replaced by new technologies. And in that case, we're less likely to see recovery. My, my, my primary uh, um, focus right now in terms of bankruptcies, if I were a macroeconomic manager, would be the SME sector. Because there's going to be thousands, if, if not more, mm-hmm. tens of thousands of bankruptcies that are not going to essentially attract attention, that are not going to be, for example, in your, on your radar screen, but that are going to impact uh, employment, of course. So the lower cost of labor clearly is going to benefit some, some businesses, and I think this is what we're seeing in, in, the, in the rally in some indices today. Notwithstanding, of course, the valuations are high. By the way, what do you think, you know, um, Jeff Gunlock said a lot of things yesterday, and he makes sometimes dramatic claims, but he did warn about increased white-collar unemployment. He said a lot more people with $100,000 a year jobs or more are going to lose them, and they're going to have to accept offers for much less pay. What do you think about that? I think that's right. I think the, the first wave has been the focus and the tension of economies has been on, uh, you know, lower skill layers in terms of the, the, the uh, uh, you know, unemployment that has resulted from, from lockdown of the of economies. By the way, not all economies have been locked down. Some, if you look at Taiwan, for example, have done pretty well uh, without, without a lockdown, but that's, that's another debate. But I think it's right to focus now on a lot of these uh, – more skilled job, um, and that essentially were buoyed by, by the previous, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, economic growth, but are not necessarily the jobs of tomorrow. That the pace of technological change is hastening, and that I think is likely to have greater consequences in terms of consumption, in terms of social stability, adding to uh, unemployment in lower skilled area. I think that is a concern. I think uh, um, companies are going to be looking who, whose business model perhaps was not already profiled for the future. They're going to be looking at this particular set of circumstances to recalibrate their employment. It will take, I think, many years uh, for the economic impact in terms of employment, uh, you know, to, 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 be, to be felt and, and, and to uh, reach a, a full recovery. And one thing for sure is um, areas that use technology are very sensitive to technology are going to change very, very profoundly. That is indeed a worry. I, I concur mm. with that analysis. Uh, Xavier, I've spoken to you a number of times in the past about well, a host of subjects, including Brexit, and I wanted to get an update from you on that subject. We see we're in the transition, of course, and we see negotiations to a new relationship or not taking place. You've in the past said that thousands of jobs could be lost from the city if we don't get any kind of future trading arrangements. Do you still think that? Or has the the virus changed your assessment? Or what's your latest uh, thinking on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, this issue is not resolved. Uh, the, the, the comments I'd made in the past were based on independent studies. One, I think, was Ernst & Young, who looked particularly at the potential impact of clearing if clearing were to leave the UK, and I think that was the basis of the study, how many uh, thousands, in that case, a couple hundred thousand jobs would be impacted. So obviously this was theoretical, but the threat is still real, and there still is uh, a significant political desire in Europe, for example, in the area of clearing, to repatriate the, um, uh, the, the clearing, particularly of euro-denominated instruments, to, to European financial centers. So these issues haven't been resolved. Um, and business has been already, I think, making decisions. Uh, I've seen statistics out there. I think in terms of jobs, you want to look at the ones that have left, but also the ones that, have, that would have and never have been uh, created. Uh, we still don't know if we're going to have a deal or not. I think the next few months will be critical. But I think in the event of no deal, I think some businesses in particular have already articulated that this would have an impact. So, yes, I continue to be worried about that. And keeping in mind, as far as financial services, that London's reputation, London's success has really been to attract global efficiencies. 
capital formation, in risk management, in clearing, in asset management. And so it's essential that London retain uh, passport access, or whatever you, whichever way you describe it, to the Eurozone, because it's not just services to Euro-denominated financial users, but it's a combination of Euro, dollars, okay. yen, and other global currencies. Uh, let me ask you about uh, something Italian before we, we let you go, Xavier. There have been reports in the Italian press about the government possibly eyeing uh, Borsa Italiana. Do you think that that is something that will develop from here? Would the LSE be interested in selling its, uh, its Italian assets, do you think? Um, well, it's, it's hard for me to speculate. I think the question <laughs> we'd better be asked of a, a, a LSE representative. So I can't speculate on what they would want to do. Um, and it, it may or may not come out of the uh, competition uh, review. But what I do know, certainly, is uh, in, in the last decade or so, uh, the Italian assets within the LSC group have been extremely well developed, very, very well managed, and have made a great contribution uh, to the bottom line of the LSC and, in fact, have enabled the, the funding uh, of uh, acquisitions across the spectrum. You know, 10 years ago, LSE Group didn't have any clearing, didn't have any indices and many other businesses. And, and part of the retooling and improvements and um, um, uh, upgrade of, of many systems and many products we had in Italy have, have paid for some of these acquisitions. I think, you know, if we, if we speculate here, in my own humble opinion, if Borza Italiana were to leave for whatever reason, the LSE Group, I don't think that would be a good thing for Italian financial markets in, in, in the long run. Because ultimately, having access to a global, world-class financial infrastructure company is really important. And we, we, we don't talk enough about this for the corporate sector. At the end of the day, it's for issuers, small companies, mid-sized companies, global companies. But for example, at the elite uh, a program uh, that was created out of Borsa Italiana for the LSE Group, which is a global program for the, the equity funding of, of small unlisted companies. This is a sort of innovation that matter, and I do think Italy has benefited substantially from access to global finance provided by the group. So I hope they can find a solution. I can't mm. speculate as to whether it, 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 it would happen or not, but in my view, it would not be a good thing uh, neither for the LSE nor for Italian financial markets, if um, if that merger, that that uh, transaction, which initially in the early years was very difficult, but has, has been substantially optimized over the years, if for some reason it, it were to that that alliance, that union, were to be broken up.